there's a way to make an entrance. <laughs> My destiny. It was now a conspiracy of witches. Download Veely today. Come with us on a musical journey through some of the most magnificent places on Earth. Great towns and cities of Europe, steeped in history and beauty, and resounding with the stories and music of the world's greatest composers. Debussy, Rossini, Chopin, Elgar, Rachmaninoff. Just some of the greats in our classical destinations. Hello, I'm Simon Callow. Welcome to Classical Destinations in the new Moscow, this ultra-modern hotel, which looks out over the rest of the city in all its glory, dominated here by part of the old Moscow, that's to say Stalin's Moscow, the extraordinary block of apartment flats, which is one of a series of what were called Stalinist Gothic buildings by which he sought to put his imprint on the great city. Of course, the defining event of modern Russian history was the Bolshevik seizure of power in October 1917, which transformed the country absolutely and affected the lives of every single citizen, not least the composers Dmitry Shostakovich and Sergei Prokofiev. Moscow is one of the world's truly unforgettable cities. Even in the middle of a Russian winter, it has the capacity to be hauntingly beautiful, the cold simply adding to the whole sensory experience. And Moscow is absolutely saturated in history. It's everywhere, and some of it, of course, is quite recent, which for anybody old enough to recall the headlines makes this city an even more enthralling place to be. In many ways, Moscow is still getting over the communist era, but there's no question the city has enthusiastically embraced capitalism. It's up there with the worst for traffic jams and the best for stylish boutiques and department stores. And what will surprise most first-time visitors is the vast number of wonderful old churches. The communists closed many and indeed demolished some, but Russia was always a highly religious country. And Orthodox Christianity survived to be enthusiastically re-embraced by Muscovites. And Moscow's historic churches are unique for their blending of classic Renaissance or Baroque styles with distinctly Russian features. The classic onion-shaped domes, for example. And this particularly magnificent example, standing right on the Moskva River, has a very interesting story. It's essentially brand new. On Stalin's orders, the original late 19th century church was blown up in 1931 to make way for a huge skyscraper. But then it was discovered the land was too boggy, so the site became, somewhat appropriately, a swimming pool. This new church was completed in 1997 and funded entirely by donations. The word Kremlin derives from Krem, meaning a fortress, and it's from this fortress that Russia's rulers, from time immemorial, surveyed 
the citizens. Of course, censorship was a primary tool. Above all, censorship of writers who were regularly sent to Siberia or shot, both by the Tsarists and by the communists. But it was the communists who introduced a special innovation. They censored music, music itself. Even inside the walled Kremlin complex, there are five quite remarkable churches. In fact, three of them are cathedrals, and the place we often tend to associate with communist rule is actually an incredibly significant site in the Russian Orthodox faith. There's so much history behind these walls. Generations of Tsars were baptized, married, and buried here. Napoleon enjoyed a brief moment of triumph here. World leaders have banqueted here. And of course, the Russian people have both suffered and benefited from the decisions made here over the centuries. The Kremlin, with its churches, palaces, and state buildings, is entirely walled, and this wall is punctuated at intervals by 20 towers. The five tallest are topped by massive red glass stars, which are lit at night, installed by Stalin as highly visible symbols of his regime. Not surprisingly, you can't just freely roam around inside the Kremlin. It's still home to Russia's government, after all. But what can be seen is truly breathtaking. The Cathedral of the Assumption, built for Ivan the Great, is a wonderful example of Italian Renaissance design mixed with Russian individuality. Whereas the Cathedral of the Annunciation is entirely Russian in design and dates back to 1482. The Cathedral of the Archangel is the youngest church on the site, a mere 500 years old. Inside are the tombs of the Tsars from the 14th and 15th centuries, including the youngest son of Ivan the Terrible. And this is the Ivan the Great bell tower, the tallest structure in Moscow when it was extended in 1600. A big bell tower needs a big bell, but unfortunately this one was so big it never got off the ground and broke in the casting pit. This segment alone weighs 11.5 tons. Yet what is truly the most surprising aspect of visiting the Kremlin's churches is just what an intensely spiritual experience it is. Enjoy for a moment then the voices of the Moscow Alamo Choir as they sing Tchaikovsky's very moving penitential prayer for Russia inside the Cathedral of the Archangel. Piotr Ilyich Tchaikovsky was, of course, a huge influence on the composers who followed him, and he's revered in Russia. In Moscow, both the conservatory and the premier concert venue were renamed to commemorate him. And this is the Tchaikovsky Concert Hall, a truly magnificent venue with seating for over 1,600. The interior is renowned for its acoustic and one of the world's biggest pipe organs, all 20 tons of it. And this is Moscow's newest music venue, the ultra-modern, multi-million dollar Moscow International House of Music. Classical music is taken very seriously indeed in this city. Sometimes even the famous Red Square becomes an open-air concert hall. Behind me, one of the great iconic buildings of the world, the Church of the Intercession, otherwise known as St. Vasily's Cathedral, St. Basil's Cathedral, built by Ivan the Terrible in the 16th century to celebrate his famous conquest over the Mongols in Kazan. That extraordinary kind of oriental building which reminds us that Russia is very close to the east. Over here is the podium from which rulers, or would-be rulers, 
made their pronouncements. Pretenders to the throne would be acclaimed by their followers only to be followed by another pretender to the throne. And here on this side of the square, this huge shopping mall, in effect, 19th century building in the Russian revival style, very beautiful during the Stalin period, was mostly used as offices, but now it's, it's a temple of couture. And further on, on this, this what was, of course, a great market square, it being Christmas now, we have an ice rink and various stalls and so on, a grand Christmas tree. I don't know what Lenin must be making of all this. He is buried there in the mausoleum, still embalmed, once the focus of the communist pilgrims kind of mecca, people would come to pay their homage to him. There used to be houses here, but Ivan III had them removed at the end of the 15th century to make way for a market, of course conveniently located right next to his palace. It's actually only about 500 meters in length, so those massive displays here of military might that were such a feature of the Cold War era created absolute traffic chaos at either end. But this is still very much where Muscovites get together for concerts and festivals or just to socialize. It's a lot more relaxed than it was even just a few years ago. Until the early 1990s, Lenin in his tomb and all the other great Soviet leaders, including Stalin, behind the mausoleum were guarded by a goose-stepping guard of honor. Now there's just one solitary soldier here in Red Square where the Red Army used to march to celebrate its might and the triumphs of the people and the party on those famous May Day parades. And as good Soviet citizens, the composers were expected to celebrate those same triumphs. Both Shostakovich and Prokofiev did more than their share of such writing. But their real music, the music that came from their heart, was of a quite different order. The Russian composers caught up in the events of 1917 all reacted quite differently. Rachmaninoff left, never to return. Stravinsky came back for a couple of concerts at the very end of his life. Prokofiev left, too, but homesickness eventually drove him back to live in Russia as a citizen. Shostakovich stayed and learned to live with all the uncertainties and insecurities that this entailed. Dmitry Shostakovich was born in 1906. He was only 11 at the time of the revolution. All his life, he remained a Soviet citizen, living, however uncomfortably, in Russia. Consequently, Shostakovich's motives have been questioned since his death. Was he, for example, willingly complicit with Stalin's murderous regime when so many other Russian artists protested in one way or another, some paying the ultimate price for their dissension? But Shostakovich was a man driven by music. It was the essence of his being. He fully understood the situation he was in and carefully, cleverly, trod a fine line between his creative integrity and the practicalities of living under Stalin's watchful eye. This is Bryosov Periolok, named actually after a Scottish family, the Bruces, in the 18th century. But uh, in the 1920s, the site of some new apartments which were given over to artists of one sort or another, to writers, the great theatre director Meyerholt lived here, and uh, composers, among them Shostakovich, Prokofiev, and here Aram Kachachurian, the Armenian composer of symphonies, concertos, and the great ballet Gayane and Spartacus. It's also the home of the notorious Composers' Union, numbers 8 to 10, just behind me. This quiet little square is an important place in 20th century Russian classical music. In many ways, it represents both a triumph and a tragedy. The triumph is perhaps best summed up in this wonderfully ebullient statue of Aram Kachaturian in full flight, just like his music. The tragedy, of course, is that so many great Russian artists didn't survive Stalin's brutal purges. Yet despite the risks they took creatively, none of the Russian composers died in this way. So perhaps Tikhon Krenikov, who ran the Composers' Union very much in compliance with Stalin's wishes and is still hated for it today, knew what he was doing. A little public humiliation was infinitely preferable to a labor camp or worse. Yet the Soviet-era artists did have some privileges. This lovely little 17th century church, right in the middle of Bryosov Periluk, the Church of the Resurrection, 
was one of the very few that was allowed to remain open. In fact, in many ways, the Composers' Union was rather a civilized organization, and it was certainly a very civilized building to be in. The composers used to play billiards downstairs together. They had one of the best restaurants in Moscow, and they decided eventually that they'd convert the apartment buildings, or some part of it, into this concert hall where they could listen to each other's music. But being a composer in the Soviet Union was always a rather risky business. In 1936, for example, Shostakovich had an enormous success with his opera Lady Macbeth of Mazensk. That is until Stalin dropped in one day to see it. The next day, he was denounced in Pravda, the opera was withdrawn from the repertory, he had to give up working on his symphony of the moment, which was the fourth symphony, and instead he wrote a year later his fifth symphony with the epigraph, A Soviet Artist's Reply to Just Criticism. And we don't know whether that was ironic or not, but it was his fifth symphony and it was a huge success. During the war, the composers, of course, were very much involved in writing patriotic music, but they ran into trouble again in the late 40s. And in fact, Shostakovich, Prokofiev, and of all people, Kachaturian, that great populist, were denounced, not in this building, but in the adjacent building, for the crime of formalism. That is to say, writing music that was not immediately accessible to the masses. And they were obliged to make a public statement endorsing socialist, or indeed Soviet, realism in music. Stalin's unpredictable ruthlessness in the 1930s wasn't called the terror for nothing. There's no question Shostakovich was a brave man. He served as a firefighter during the siege of Leningrad, an experience which resulted in his defiant but passionate Seventh Symphony. And he certainly continued to sail close to the wind as he sought to be true to himself artistically, but without antagonizing the authorities. Sergei Prokofiev was born in 1891, while Russia was still ruled, however shakily, by the Romanovs, whose great double eagles surmount the historical museum here. He was something of a prodigy, graduating from St. Petersburg Conservatory with his first piano concerto and writing a whole succession of remarkable pieces. When the revolution came in 1917, he worked out that it was not a great place for a composer to be. So in 1918, he left for America and for Europe. But in 1927, he returned for a highly successful tour and felt again the lack of his native roots. And so he came back to Russia, where he enjoyed for the rest of his life an extremely uneasy relationship with the Communist Party. Immensely gifted, Prokofiev was a great experimenter as a young composer, but later his music became more measured, though always distinctive and often very dramatic. He could turn his musical hand to almost anything. Symphonies, concertos, chamber music, operas, film scores. There's drama aplenty in Prokofiev's almost abstract Duo for Two Violins, written in 1932, when he was back in Moscow, performed now by the Australian Chamber Orchestra's Richard Tonietti and Satu Vanska. It's such a compelling work that you forget that you're playing a violin sonata. It's not a violinistic piece. It's this incredible, you know, diatribe and argument you're having with, you know, another person, as in the other violinist. In that respect as well, he's created something unique. One imagines more voices there, or more instruments, than only two violins. It's a very violent piece too. Prokofiev undoubtedly suffered the most at the hands of Stalin. He had believed his international reputation and his popularity at home would provide some degree of protection. It didn't, and he was profoundly shocked by his censure. The 1948 denunciation shattered him, and creatively, he never recovered. And there was worse to come. His Spanish-born ex-wife was arrested and sent to a labor camp. Prokofiev tried to help, but there was little he could do. As it happens, Lina Prokofiev was eventually released and lived to be 91. <laughs> 
And despite the darkness around him, Prokofiev remained the optimist he had always been. Talking about one of his last works, a ten-movement oratorio called On Guard for Peace, he wrote, It is my conviction that the peoples of the earth will defend peace in order to save and to preserve civilization, our children and our future. There's a challenge in playing with a simile or the same instrument, a different person, in that you want two different characters, but not so that they're competing. You need to be on the same platform and be able to make the same colours, but choose from the palette so that it's a contrasting element. This is one of the most remarkable places in a city full of them. It's the cemetery attached to the 16th century Novodevichy convent, and it's the final resting place of many famous Russians. Despite the busy streets just outside and a railway line that runs along one side, it's an incredibly peaceful place, and it has to be said, an enthralling distillation of recent Russian history. So here in Novodievichy Cemetery, surrounded by so many of the bureaucrats and apparatchiks who oppressed him throughout his working life, lies Dmitry Shostakovich, now universally acknowledged as one of the greatest composers of the 20th century, one who perhaps more than many expressed so many of the frustrations and crises and anxieties of his times. It took our guide a little while to find the grave of Sergei Sergeyevich Prokofiev, the 20th century Russian composer best known outside Russia, lost in his own cemetery. Prokofiev was ill for many years before he died, and his work does show a diminution in that effervescence and sharp brilliance for which his early work was so remarkable. He died finally in 1953 by a terrible irony, only an hour or so within the death of Joseph Stalin, who had so bedeviled his life in so many ways, with the result that his death passed almost unnoticed. But history will always remember Prokofiev's dazzling sequence of extraordinary orchestral masterpieces, Peter and the Wolf, Romeo and Juliet, the symphonies, the piano concertos, all of them immortal. And amid the snowy silence, there comes the reassurance that whatever happens, the music lives on. We've come to the end of this extraordinary journey through many of the great places in classical music, from small villages in rural England and France to some of the world's most dynamic cities like Moscow, Madrid and Rome. We've met an extraordinary collection of composers who, often doing simply what they loved, have made a huge contribution to music and to our enjoyment of it. Many of them lived through turbulent times but carried on regardless, always finding ways to express themselves in their music. It's been inspiring. I hope it has been for you too. So it's goodbye from me, Simon Callow, and Classical Destinations. We'll see you again next time. Bye.